Whisper, whisper, tiny baby, he's sleeping the hay. Whisper, whisper, baby born today. Oh, shout it out from the highest mountain. Shout it out, hear what I say. Shout it out to the hills and valleys. Tiny baby is born today. Whisper, whisper. Tiny baby in a manger lay, whisper, whisper, baby born today. Oh, shout it out with a thousand voices. Shout it out, let the music play. Shout it out, go tell all the people. Tiny baby is born today, whisper, whisper. Tiny baby in a manger lay, whisper, whisper. Baby born today, whisper, whisper, tiny baby, he sleep in the hay, whisper, whisper, baby born today, baby born today. Mary had a my Lord, yes, my Lord, yes, my Lord. Mary had a baby, yes, my Lord. Glory, Lord. Shout it out, hear what I say. Shout it out to the hills and the valleys. Tiny baby is born today. Whisper, whisper. Tiny baby in a manger lay. Whisper, whisper. Baby born today. Whisper, whisper. Tiny baby, he sleep in the hay. Whisper, whisper. Baby born today, whisper, whisper. They will always sound good, won't they? That was the Heritage Quartet, and, and that was from last year. But uh, if you closed your eyes, I think you could, you could vision them being here. Um, just a few things before we begin our worship. It's, at each door, you will see a basket. And in that basket is uh, a little sign that says, Tornado Victims. And if you would, this week and next week, uh, those baskets will be in place. And if you would like to place an offering in there for the tornado victim, victims in addition to your regular offering, please do so. Just a reminder or a point of information, the United Methodist men this morning. Very graciously committed $2,000 to this effort. I have a note. This is from Rita Motzinger. She says, to our church family, we are grateful for all the food and Mark's dinner after the, and, and Mark's dinner after the funeral. It is such a blessing to have such an amazing family. Mark was always here when the doors opened. 
or whatever it was. He loved the Methodist men. He just loved church, period. He was always ready to lend a hand wherever it was, where it was needed. I know he is looking down on us and celebrating his life with God now. He is out of pain and he's been made whole. Thank you for all your prayers during Mark's time with dementia. Thank you, Gail Schof, for your wonderful cards. Thank you, and may God bless you all. Love, Rita Motzinger. And I was handed a very special note today. See, notes don't have to come on cards. They can come on sticky pads. Um, <clears throat> God's love still shines bright. That's what it said in the front of one of the cards that I received. Be it ever so true, card after card, wishing me peace, joy, and love. I felt like I was opening present after present. Thank you so much for remembering me at Christmas time. I love each and every one of you. Merry Christmas, Elaine Latham. I'm so thankful that she could text this to Wendy and Wendy could transcribe it to us. The administrative board meeting has been canceled for this evening. Uh, so take the night off. And um, the men's barbecue uh, shoulders and, and Boston butts, if you haven't pick, gotten yours, see one of the Methodist men immediately. These things are going to be ordered in the next day or two. So if you miss it, you've missed it. So uh, just take care of that. All right? So let us bow in prayer. Almighty and amazing God, you love us regardless of how small we are, how big we are, how important we are, how simple we are. And for that, Lord, we are thankful. For we know we don't have to fit a mold. We know, Lord, that you love us just for who we are. And for that, we are truly thankful. Lord, as we gather here in this sanctuary, we pray, Lord, your presence. We pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit to fill us so that we would worship and praise you in an acceptable way. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus whom you sent as a gift of your amazing grace. And it's in Christ's name we pray today. Amen. This is the fourth Sunday in Advent. Today we light the fourth candle on the wreath. The first Sunday we lit the candle of hope. On the second Sunday we lit the candle of love. On the third Sunday we lit the candle of joy. And today we light the candle of peace. Our world, <clears throat> our world is not always a peaceful world. People hurt other people. Nations are at war against other nations, and some are at war amongst themselves. People yell and scream at one another, instill in fear. Yet, in the heart of people, there is a hope for world peace. God's promise of peace is found in the Prince of Peace, Jesus, who said... Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. During Advent, we hope and pray that we, as well as all people throughout the world, will seek and find God's love and therefore know the peace that Jesus spoke of. Let us pray. 
Dear God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for those in our world today who seek to act for peace. Help us look for ways to be peacemakers wherever we are and wherever you would lead us to go. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning again. Won't you stand? <clears throat> Angels from the realms of glory wing your flight or all the earth. Creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds, shepherds in the fields abiding, watching o'er your flocks by Let the nations sing and 
celebrate you right now in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have gathered to praise and worship the Lord our God, His Son Jesus Christ, through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, it is good for us to also gather in a posture of prayer, to bow our heads before God, to yield our will to His. As we gathered here to pray, we pray for our friends and our neighbors, but we also pray for those whom we don't know around the world, around this nation. So let us bow together. Almighty God, we come to you as an imperfect people. Each and every one of us, Lord, knows Oh, I pray we would know how much you love us. Regardless of our stature. Regardless of our humbleness or our greatness. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. And we know, Lord, that even those who might seem insignificant and so small, Oh, you have great hopes and great desires for us to accomplish your will. For when we accomplish your will above our own, that is when we become great. That is when we thrive. That is when we grow. So I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would say, I am second. As we place you and Christ Jesus and your Holy Spirit first in our lives. And Lord, as we are second, we lift up those 
whom we don't know. Praying that they would too know your presence, especially in their dire circumstances. For all the people who suffered in the paths of tornadoes that would have stretched from here to the Outer Banks. We pray for them, Lord. We know that we can send tokens in offerings. But Lord, there will be a time when we can send ourselves. And I pray for that time. I pray for that time when we could be a people of mission to go and to help through the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And that we would be a presence. Maybe if it's just to pray with people. Maybe if it's to remove debris. Maybe if it's to clean up, scrub floors. Well, then that's what we'll do. Because Jesus taught us to love our neighbor. And in so loving, in such a way, we can honor you. So I pray, Lord, soon show us how to respond. Show us how to be there. Lord, we pray for the church at this time, this time when we celebrate the birth of Christ, the coming of Christ into the world, into a seemingly insignificant manger. Oh, but that feed trough, Lord, is, oh, such a wonderful, glorious crib. For it it held our Savior Jesus, your one and only Son, who is you in the flesh. For you have come among us in Christ Jesus, and for that we are thankful. Lord, we pray that the church would be a voice of freedom throughout the world, a voice of hope, a voice of peace, a hope, a, a voice of joy, and a voice of love. Lord, we pray for Mary Alice Myers and Larry. Be with him this week as he undergoes a procedure. Lord, we ask for travel mercies for Christmas. We pray, Lord, to be with Ronald Pugh in these troublesome days. Lord, we know that Evelyn Clodfelter has been in hospital care, but now she's moved to a facility that would help her in Pittsburgh. I pray, Lord, that the distance would not prove too far for us to communicate with her. We pray and lift up Diane Casey. For Randy Barrier and the loss of his wife. We pray, Lord, that his life would continue to be a tapestry of your love wound into it. We lift up the family of Abby Wall. And we give you praise, Lord, for hearing every unspoken prayer that we have, no matter how quietly we want to keep it, no matter how embarrassed or ashamed we might be to speak it. Lord, you know, you, you know our hearts. So we lift up every one of those unspoken prayers. And Lord, in this time of Advent and Christmas, I pray, Lord, that we would forget about all the trappings and trimmings. For that's just the world's way of celebrating Christ's Mass. But we as men and women and children of faith, we celebrate in our hearts the birth of Christ the Lord, the birth of the Savior Jesus. For He is your amazing gift of grace. Oh, may we truly be thankful. And in measure of that thanksgiving, Lord, we pray together 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
be seated. If I could have the kids come up. It's a good thing to need more chairs. Here you go. All right. Well, I brought some Christmas treats today. But first I have to ask you some questions. Do you know the name of the town Jesus was born in? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, that's right. Now what does Bethlehem mean? means where Jesus was born. Yep, but remember, it's Hebrew. So I'm going to teach you a little bit of Hebrew today. Okay? Bethlehem is two words. Bethlehem. Okay? Now, what do you suppose Beth means? Nope. It means house. Now, lehem. What does lehem mean? If someone says, would you like some lehem? What would you tell them? Boo, boo. Uh, yeah, uh, it's what kind of food? Ham. No, not ham. <laughs> <laughs> truly, 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 a Hebrew would never ask for ham. <laughs> Bread. Lahem means bread. So if Beth means house and house, la, bread. house of bread. Now, why do we make gingerbread houses at Christmas time? Because it's a tradition and, and Jesus was born. Right? It's a tradition and Jesus was born. That's right. But this is a very literal interpretation. House of bread. Gingerbread. Okay? Now, what do you suppose? Why do we make gingerbread? To go with the houses. Men. Because it's Jesus. It's Jesus, that's right. Jesus said in the Gospels, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And so we know that when Jesus became human, when Jesus was born, okay, the bread of life came down from heaven. And so we don't just make gingerbread men or gingerbread houses because it's a tradition. We make it because it symbolizes Jesus. Now, why do you suppose we have this cookie? Eat this gingerbread eat. cookie? You're right. Hey, no mm. fair. I appreciate that. No fair. Mm. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Trust me, that's all I want of it right now, too. So, whenever you see at Christmas time gingerbread, whatever, cookie, houses, whenever you have bread with your meal. And see, a lot of times our meals on Christmas have special breads, special cookies. Remember that Jesus was born in the house of bread, that Jesus, the bread of life, came down for you and you and you and you and you and you and me. Okay? Can you remember that? Tell me. Jesus is the bread of life. Bread of life. Okay, we can do better than that, can't we? One, two, three. Jesus is the bread of life. Very good. All right, will you pray with me? Okay. Lord Jesus, something as simple as bread, we, we share and we thank you. May our hearts always be full. Of your love, your love 
That is the yeast. That is the yeast. That grows us. That grows us. Be with these children. Be with these children. As they grow. As they grow. And may Jesus. And may Jesus. Be the yeast in their life. Be the yeast in their life. Amen. Amen. All right. Good job. Help me with the chairs, guys. All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. You're, you're doing real good, but scoot it across the floor over there. Okay. Good job. Good job. You never know what they're going to say. That boy has been stuck on ham all week. <laughs> Will you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Our passage today is taken from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his, his greatness will teach to the end of the earth, and he will be our peace. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And will you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we are thankful for the word that you have given us in the scriptures and through Christ your Son. I pray, Lord, for those who hear these words, that they would hear your truth, and that I would only be your servant to deliver this truth in Christ's name. Amen. The Old Testament Proverbs tell us there are four things on earth that are small, and yet they're extremely wise. The ants. They aren't strong individually, but they store up food all summer long for the long winters. Hyraxes. Now, I had to look up what a hyrax was, and it's a little shrew mouse. They're not very powerful creatures, but they live in the crevices of the rocks of the, of the hills. And when they're cornered, they're, they're ferocious. And then there's the locusts. Now, we all know about those locusts, don't we? Yeah? But those locusts, they come in hordes. They come in great swarms. But they have no king. But yet they march from field to field to field, devastating it like an army regiment. And then there's lizards. I like lizards. I used to have a good time catching them when I was a kid. They're easy to catch. Yet they sneak past the palace guards and they make their homes even in the king's palace. Yep. Not one of those animals on its own. Not one of those creatures on its own is mighty. But they're wise. They know what to do. God, God demonstrates His use of the weak to be the source of His magnificent works. 
Great things do come in small packages. You've heard that before, haven't you? But yet we go to the table when we're playing Dirty Santa and we have a choice. Big package, ooh, or little package, ooh. You know, and, and so we wonder which, is, which one's going to be the better of the two. God does choose the smallest. God does choose the weakest. God does choose the, those who are who seemingly insignificant to do, to do extraordinary things. Bethlehem. Bethlehem Ephrathah. We know that Bethlehem means house of bread. But what does Ephrathah mean? It means fruitful. And we could look and we can see that Bethlehem, the house of bread, is truly fruitful. Because that's where greatness came to Israel, through Bethlehem. Bethlehem was considered insignificant. So perhaps did the people consider the infant Jesus as an unlikely candidate for the Messiah. Yet within the being of the gentle baby Jesus resided the glory and majesty of the great triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is made real in Jesus the baby, in Jesus the Messiah. The greatness of God was rocked in a manger, a feed trough, something else so insignificant, something else so simple, so small, so humbling, so embarrassing. How many of you would readily put your baby in a trough? I know when our girls were expected, we wanted the best for them. Is there anybody else who doesn't wish that? No, we look for the best to place our child in. But that was all that Mary and Joseph had, a feed trough. And so they used the best they had. We look at it and we say, oh, yuck. And then we look at it and say, well, how can we romanticize it? How can we make it pretty for our nativity scenes today? You cannot make a feed box pretty. It is what it is. But throughout the scriptures, we're told of the smallest or the least rising up to be great. And the truth is, there are several small to greatness stories written in the history. But small doesn't mean insignificant. You go out and you look back into the scriptures and you'll come across a, a woman named Rachel. She's the second wife of Jacob, the least. An insignificant woman. But she's the mother of one of the most famous sons. Joseph, the dreamer. You remember Joseph, his brothers, he, he was dreaming all the time and his brothers really resented him. And when he came out with his coat of many colors, ooh, they hated him even worse. And they sold him to a band of gypsies who took him to Egypt. And there he was enslaved, but he rose up. He didn't stay down. This little, simple, insignificant boy rose up to be the second in power in all of Egypt under Pharaoh. And he welcomed his family in when famine in Israel had gotten too bad and they had gone to Egypt to find food. Joseph, unbeknownst to them, was there in a, possession, a position of, of power. And he says, y'all come. And he welcomed them. And thus the nation of Israel began to be formed. 
All this because of Rachel. An insignificant girl who married Jacob. And then there was Ruth. You look at Ruth and you say, wow, what a wonderful woman. But you know what? Ruth was a foreigner. Ruth was a Moabite pagan woman. She didn't grow up within the Hebrew people. She didn't grow up in the customs and traditions of Judaism. No, she was a pagan. She was married to one of Naomi's sons. But you'll never find in all of Scripture a woman so dedicated, a woman so devoted as Ruth was. Ruth could be a model for each and every one of us. She was humble, but she was devoted. She was caring, and she was loving. And she told her widowed mother-in-law, wherever you go, I'll go, and your God will be my God. And she meant it. She helped Naomi navigate through several famines in her life. Her husband had died. Her sons had died. She had no prospects for tomorrow. But Ruth was there. And Ruth cared. And Ruth went with her back. And she met her second husband, Boaz. And because Boaz was an honorable man, Boaz took in Ruth and her family. Boaz married Ruth. And it seems to be that this small, insignificant Moabite woman became the only non-Jewish writer in the Bible, the book of Ruth. Everything else falls along the religious lines. But Ruth is a writer who is out of the ordinary. She was extraordinary because of her devotion, because of what she learned and what she did. She also became the great-grandmother of the greatest king Israel ever had. King David. Now David himself, oh, he was the youngest of Jesse's seven sons. In fact, when Samuel went looking for the next king of Israel, Jesse didn't even tell him, hey, what about David? Not at all. Jesse was going like, don't worry about him. We got six other boys here. Big, strapping boys. They're men, they're, they'll be the king anywhere. But not Israel. Samuel didn't see in them the heart that was necessary for the good king of Israel. But when he looked upon David, he saw a youth who was glowing with health. He had a fine appearance and handsome features, but Samuel was given a gift by God to be able to look deep within a person. And he could look deep within David and he could see that within David was the heart of a king. You can look like a king all you want to, but if you don't have the heart of a king, you better leave that job behind. And Samuel saw in David a mighty king. And David was a mighty king. We could see that he was mighty in that he slew the Philistine giant, Goliath. In defense of his father's herds, he killed a bear. He killed a lion. He had the heart to do the job. That small boy had a greatness about him that only God could see. And Mary. Now we think about Mary and we, we fail to see it even pro, perhaps at this time how small and gentle of a girl she might have been.
But God chose the small and gentle girl to be the birthing vessel of the Savior Jesus. She must have been a very special young woman in her faith and her willingness to accomplish not her will, not her desires, but God's will, God's desires. See, Mary put herself second so that God could be first. She had the willingness of her faith to accomplish the will of God above all things in her life. And because of that, God found favor in Mary. And God chose Mary. Of all the other people that God could have chosen, God chose Mary because of her disposition, because of her desire to serve God first. She found favor with God. And as the angel of God, Gabriel, spoke with her about the child she would bear, no matter how unbelievable it might seem, according to human thinking, Mary courageously said yes. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And suddenly, her world changed. The whole world changed. Or had it. What began as a magnificent promise and a journey of gladness, as Mary was greeted by her relative Elizabeth, she was filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and she said to her, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary responded to her. She says, my soul, my soul glorifies the Lord. Not me. Not my soul glorifies me because I've been chosen to be the vessel in which the Christ would be born. Not me, because I am the Theotokos, the mother of God. Not me, because God chose me above all the other girls. No, not at all. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. She never lost perspective that it is God whom she serves. She never lost that perspective. And, that, and despite the greatness of her mission, Mary praised God and rejoiced in what God had done for her, how God had blessed her. Although the world in which she lived would see her as cursed, as an unwed mother-to-be, and they would shun her, and they would treat her poorly. For that's what they did back in those days with harlots. And we know that that's not what Mary was. We know that Mary is the blessed mother of Christ Jesus our Lord. That Christ Jesus our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. But Mary knew and trusted God's words to her, and because of that she knew that throughout the generations, throughout the days in which she lived, and throughout the generations to come, she would be blessed. And she knew that the son that she would give birth to would be Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus entered this world born in a stable and placed in a manger, a feed box, a dirty, insignificant feed box for cows and donkeys. 
in the small town of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, the fruitful house of bread. The King of kings and Lord of lords, the Son of God, the Messiah and Savior of the world, came not as a king, but as a peasant among peasants. But small as he was, he was not insignificant. A star in the sky was set to announce his birth by God. God who filled all creation with order. God took from that order one star and placed it in the heavens, stationary above Bethlehem, above that stable. He removed it from its orbit and caused it to shine brighter and brightest over the small town of Bethlehem to announce to the world the good news of great joy that the birth of His Son had been accomplished. An invitation had been set in the sky bidding that anyone could come and see. Now if nothing else, God has taught us through Rachel, Ruth, David, Mary, and Bethlehem that the smallest and most ordinary can and do accomplish the most extraordinary things. If they want to accomplish His will in, the, in this old world first. And you know, each and every one of us today can do amazing things if we would just desire to get out of the way, to be second, to allow God, to allow Christ, to allow the Holy Spirit to be first in our lives today. We can do extraordinary things. Not one of us, regardless of our stature, is insignificant. Many years ago, a pastor of a small town was confronted by a church member just before the church service. And he was told, there must be something wrong with your preaching and your ministry. There's been only one person added to the church's role in this whole year. And he's only a boy. What a way to start Sunday morning. The minister went to the pulpit that day with a grieved and heavy heart. And after the service, he wished to be alone. And he lingered in the church after everyone else had left so he could pray. And he cried out to God, asking why his efforts seemed so insignificant and in vain. And after a while of pouring his heart out to God at the altar, he became conscious that he was not alone. He looked up and he saw that it was the boy. His name was Robert. Robert had become a Christian just that last year. And the pastor asked, well, Robert, what is it? And Robert replied, Do you think that if I were willing to work hard, I could ever become a preacher? A preacher or even a missionary? There was a long pause. And tears filled the eyes of the old minister. And at length he said, this heals the ache in my heart, Robert. I see the divine hand of God now. Yes, I think you will become a great preacher. That boy's name was Robert Moffat. And as he grew, Robert Moffat wrote, who was written off as a, an insignificant boy became a glorious fruit of the old pastor's labor. He became a name known not only in the courts of heaven, but throughout Africa. For Robert Moffat 
translated the scriptures into the language of the African people that he became a missionary to. A boy who was considered insignificant at one time became amazingly great in service of God. And so, regardless of how small or insignificant you might see yourself, or as others might regard you, God sees beyond what the world sees, and God sees in you and in me a greatness if we would only put ourselves second, second to God, and strive to be faithful and say yes to accomplishing His will instead of our own. No matter who you are or how small you are, you are not insignificant because you matter to God. And God can do great things through you if, like Mary, you just say yes. Glory be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Almighty and everlasting God, we are so thankful that we have every opportunity every day to serve you. I pray, Lord, that each person in this room, each person within the sound of my voice, would say yes and place themselves second to serve your will, to serve your desires, so that we might be a stronger people, that we might be a growing church, that we might be the significant person you desire us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to turn to number 217 in our hymnal and sing Away in a Manger. As you go forth from here today, I hope and I pray that every day of your life you would enjoy the bread of life born in the house of bread, Christ Jesus our Lord. Share Him. Share Him with your friends. Share Him with your neighbors. Share Him with your co-workers, but share Him 
so that the world would know that Christmas is not about Santa. It is about the Savior of the world, Jesus. Go in peace. Amen. Have a wonderful